Coming to you from WHU. <laughs> on the banks of the Rhine River. In beautiful Fallendar, Germany. This is the best and most awesome founder podcast. A show about entrepreneurs, innovators, advisors, and educators, and the stories that make them who they are today. Philip von Hammerstein, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's really nice to have you. Uh, thank you for being willing to come on the show in such a last minute. I know you came to Beirut for some meetings, and next thing you know, you have a microphone in your face. So. Yeah, the way it always happens, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> so, Sometimes you just have to be ready to, to turn on the switch and, and get it going, you know, especially as an entrepreneur. You never know when you've got to get out there and, and do your spiel, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, good. Philip von Anerstein from Le Wagon Coding Bootcamp, the VP of Operations in Berlin and the, the catalyst behind the uh, Berlin offices and uh, one of the, the growing offices of this amazing Largest coding facility program in the world? I'm quite sure we are by now. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so, welcome to the podcast. You know, we'll, I'd love to hear from you today about a number of different things, about what you're doing now, of course, about how you got to this amazing place, your connections to this place here at Vehau. One mm -hmm. of the great things about this uh, amazing university in this tiny little town on the river is, for some reason, the the notable alumni just show up here all the time, so there must be something that keeps pulling you guys back here. Potentially Stockholm Syndrome, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I can certainly relate to that. Well, um, let's kick things off. Um, i really like to understand not only where you are now, mm -hmm. but where you came from and how you got here. Every entrepreneur seems to have a really interesting journey and experience. <laughs> um, uh, a collection of serendipitous moments that bring them to where they are today. So, Philip, maybe you can tell us a little about your entrepreneurial journey. Absolutely. Um, so, I'm a born and raised Berliner, actually. Um, I always say I'm one of the three people in the Berlin startup scene that actually come from this city. And uh, I did small things as a student, um, but basically, it kicked off joining a startup in 2009 um, to do my internship. Before WHU, you have to do an internship. And by luck, the brother of a good friend of mine had a startup also together with a WHU alumni, actually. And they took me in as an intern. I had very little idea about tech um, back in the day. Started there in marketing, had a lot of fun, then went to the HAU, um, and ever since been somehow affected by the by the startup bug and couldn't couldn't really leave the space anymore. So I worked for a couple of startups. I spent a year at a venture capital fund, large uh, French VC. Um, I even went to Silicon Valley for a few months doing tech M and A there. And uh, all this time, I, I really yeah just had a lot of fun along the way. Met amazing people. Founded three companies, um, all of them failed spectacularly. And uh, then at some point realized, okay, I, I have a bachelor's and by now also a master's degree here from BHU. And um, I realized, okay, as a business guy, I'm not that valuable to startups in an early stage. And that's the stage where I'm most interested in, that I'm most interested in. Seeing us, uh, that's where you really have a green field and you can just go for it. And uh, so, yeah, I decided, okay, I need to, to learn to code. I am the bottleneck here. I can build beautiful PowerPoint presentation. I can build amazing Excel models that are quite complex, but they're really, really worth nothing if there isn't someone actually coding the product. And so I decided I need to learn to code. I started up with a few online courses um, I tried Udemy, Udacity, Treehouse, Codecademy, and just realized, okay, those aren't working for me. A, I don't have the concentration oftentimes. Even if I finish a course, I still feel I don't really know this yet. So I looked into other options, into doing a, another bachelor degree in, in computer science, asked a few friends that are developers, and they were like, don't fucking do it. Um, I didn't learn to code there. I taught myself. So um, then I found coding bootcamps, 
and I really, really fell in love with the idea. Thought about doing it in the US. Uh, the price tag was a bit too high for me, so um, I looked in Europe, and well, the wagon was the best rated. So I went there uh, in Brussels, actually. Loved my time there, met amazing people that I'm still in touch with, and decided, okay, this is what we need in Berlin. If there is one thing we need in Berlin, which is, from my perspective, the biggest problem of the Berlin startup ecosystem, it's we're not technical enough. There is a lot of amazing ideas walking around in Berlin, but very, very non-technical. Munich has very strong technical startups, Aachen. Very strong technical startups. Berlin just doesn't. So we need, from my perspective, more people that are developers and more people with the developers' mindset. So I actually wrote an email to the founders and said, okay, I want to bring Le Bagon to Berlin. And two emails and two Skype calls later, they said, okay, let's fucking do it. And that was over two years ago, um, built up the Berlin office. It went very, very well. And uh, now we are at right about 40 students each class we run. And yeah, it's been a fun journey. <laughs> that little story, I, I have so many questions about it already. <laughs> the first question is, is how the heck did you get them to agree with only two Skype calls and two emails? Were you, did you just have one hell of a value proposition or were they just attuned to the opportunity in Berlin as well? Like, it sounds like this <laughs> This is one of those serendipitous moments that, you know, spontaneous mm -hmm. uh, magic happening, because that that's fast, right? Absolutely. Um, I would always attribute whatever worked out for me, I would attribute 80% to luck. Um, right place, right time. At the end of the day, um, they were just looking into growing to different markets. They had opened up London six months ago and it worked really well. So they said, okay, there is an opportunity to grow right now. And uh, I had pretty much exactly the, the skill set they were looking for. Plus I was an alumni, so I knew what I was selling. I was, I love the program, um, still do to this day. So it was just, yeah. So what was, of, what was the program you did at Le Vagon? So at Le Vagon, we're a very product driven bootcamp. Um, we're, we're very focused around entrepreneurs and um, basically it's a nine-week program where we do a lot of back-end and front-end, focusing mostly on back-end um, development because we say that's where, where the hardest nuts are usually to crack. Um, and it, teach, it has this product mindset, meaning that students come out having built several products literally from scratch. So they know how to build a digital product, how to build a app or a web app to be more specific from scratch. They know how to work together with other developers. They've used Git and GitHub. They know all the tools that as a, as a, as a developer I use every day. So are you largely PHP centric? Is that where it kind of starts? No, we're actually uh, Ruby and Ruby on Rails centric. So the bootcamps are usually in either focusing on Ruby or on JavaScript. We very strongly believe in Ruby being the significantly better choice. And um, so we start out with three weeks of Ruby, then we do databases, SQL, then um, we move into front end HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then afterwards we bring it all together in Rails um, so that in week seven of the nine weeks, Actually, the students in a team of three or four people already build an Airbnb clone. Uh -huh. Within just five days, they built Airbnb from scratch, including booking, including payment. And it's also, from my perspective, it, it enables you to build your own products, to build your own MVPs at least. And at the same time, it reduces the amount of respect you have for many tasks because that your developers do because you understand, okay, this is something that is harder to implement or this is actually not that hard. Why should it take two days to change the color of a button? It just fucking should. Right. Um, and being able to better assess, okay, what should take, how long, how do I explain a feature to a developer in the right way um, is, from our perspective, one of the main value propositions of the book. I'm interested that you said that kind of one of the projects is building an Airbnb type clone, multi-tenant 
a vendor booking engine, essentially, because <laughs> I have experience building one of those. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting product. You know, yeah. Just looking at it from the, the user standpoint, you have the end user who's making the booking. You have another group of users who are listing their products, and then you have whatever organization that utilizes it running the admin function of it. So you literally have three different different yeah. user segments yeah. in that. And to me, that's a it's an interesting model to use because it really makes a, a developer also think in the terms of the product and how the end user uses that product. And that's something that I think has been a historical challenge between entrepreneurs trying to build mm -hmm. things and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, developers actually doing the heavy lifting of building it. Can you tell me why you, why you guys use a model like that? Why is there, is there some rhyme or reason behind that type of approach? The easy reason is everyone knows Airbnb, so it's something that across any of our 30 cities, every student that comes to us has heard and has usually used Airbnb before, so the product is very clear. It's, um, it's doable in five days, we just know you can build the following features in these five days, and it has exactly all, or many of the major things you need to think of as a developer in there. Um, so it has multi-users with different roles and um, different user stories. It has uh, very nice functionalities like maps, like payment, like search. That as a developer, I will very regularly have to implement. I have to give quite a bit of thought to the database design. So it has all the components of a fully fledged app that I as a developer need to build. So, so many developers these days are able to access the you know, Tools like GitHub provide a lot of code out there already, so yep. developers don't have to build things completely from scratch. You know, they still have to put a lot of components and modules together. Is is that a part of the kind of teaching practice of coding now that don't reinvent the wheel, build off it? Um, percent from our perspective, seventy percent brand out of any any new idea, any new product is usually just plugging different APIs together. Mm -hmm. And then the remaining 30%, that's your secret sauce. So 70% is if I'm building something like Airbnb, putting Google Maps in there, instead of having 40 engineers that are just working to build a map product. Using Twilio to send text messages, instead of having another 30 developers sitting there, building text messaging gateways with all the major carriers globally. Um, using different libraries and gems to actually do user management, to do Facebook um, login, to do all these things that in theory I could of course as a developer build, but where I'm just wasting my time. Um, and for, for us I think that's really, really important. We very strongly believe that any question you have in coding has been asked, usually on Stack Overflow, which is the number one Q&A site for developers. You just need to find it. So you, as a developer, your number one skill is knowing how to Google. Right, right. <laughs> so, you know, when I think of, of course, I'm not a coder, but I've worked with my fair share of them. And, you know, when I look at developers that I've worked with, I always saw kind of a, a dividing line. And again, in my non-technical and layman's terms, there were the guys that were coders, and there were the guys that were architects, and to a certain degree, entrepreneurs mm -hmm. as well. You know, they weren't just writing code and putting the pieces together. They were um, in charge of the greater vision of the, the app. They understood some of the, the theory behind it. They were really wearing the hat of the entrepreneurs that were building it and the end users that were, were uh, using it. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, obviously if you're doing a, a code academy in, in a week or, you know, following up with a few weeks after that, you're getting just the basics. Yeah. How, how do, do these developers take the leap from this, their initial foray, foray of being able to build an app or in, in five days in this mm -hmm. case to taking it to the next level and turning it into a career? I think from my perspective, um, the, the important part is as a developer, you never stop learning. It's one of the amazing, 
one of the defining and amazing features for me as a developer that actually I just have to continuously learn. And usually I get paid by my employer to learn because I need to learn new technologies, new languages, new ways of doing things because languages continuously upgrade. I mean, yes, we also get updates for PowerPoint from Microsoft, but let's be honest here, the feature set is pretty much the same. Always it's just a new and nicer design. Whereas languages really evolve over time and new frameworks come along. Three years ago, no one talked about React. And now it's really the hot shit. Everyone needs to move to React um, in, in some form. And this is, this is a continuous process. And I'm quite sure two years from now, if we're sitting here again, uh, React is long gone. And there will be a new framework that is the hyped framework. Um, which, by the way, for from a business perspective, is really on this important to understand that just because something is the new thing and super sexy, my developers tell me we have to rewrite the whole app. That is not necessarily true. Um, with all due respect for developers, and I have a shit ton of respect for developers, um, that very regularly, especially in the early stages of a startup, is more the in German we say Spieltrieb. Um, the developer wanting to play with the new technology, which is from a commercial point of view, just completely unnecessary, but will throw you back another six months until the whole app has been rewritten and has been rewritten in Go or Erlang or whatever to be, yes, we can now serve uh, 50 million concurrent users at the same time on our platform. Congratulations. Let's maybe get to 500 first before thinking about 50 million. This is, if, you, if your problem is, my app is too slow because I have too many users, that's an amazing problem to have. And that's the point when you should solve it, from my perspective, not taking another three months, especially in the early stages when you have very little cash, to build something where then at the end of the day, you never get above maybe 5,000 users. Congratulations for your amazing technology that could serve 50 million. And you, ju <laughs> you just unpack the million dollar question to me right there, which is, uh, you know, I, it, in my experience building technology companies and, and owning software development companies, one of the great obstacles that non-technical entrepreneurs like me face dealing with technical talent is there appears to be a propensity for over-engineering and over-building. And frankly, it comes from both sides. I can't just point to the coders. Oftentimes, the, the um, entrepreneurs are wanting so many features that they don't necessarily need. On the flip side, the developers are often saying, well, you know, this is, we're counting milliseconds <laughs> in our response rate on this thing, and they're seeing it as being inefficient or not being able to handle a load. And what happens if we get, you know, a 500 concurrent users, it's going to crash, and you know, you're happy if you're getting 500 people in a week kind of thing. But there, there is an underlying tension between the traditional yeah. non-technical entrepreneur and the technical software developer. I think we talked earlier, you've, you've been on both <laughs> sides of that argument. I've experienced it both as well. Maybe you can share a little bit about your experiences in being non-technical and engaging on the technical side and some of the challenges that you see in that relationship that is so dominant in the tech entrepreneurship world. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, from the largest part of my career, I was non, absolutely non-technical. And in retrospect, I really did every single mistake you could do. And I think for me, one of, one of the main things there is to look at, okay, uh, how do different people work? And as a business person, I get a call or I get an email or I just sit there and I have an idea and I want a quick technical assessment of it. So what did I always do? So I did that so many times. And in retrospect, I'm so sorry to all the developers because I just went up to them and said, hey, do you have a minute? I have a question or I have an idea or I have a request, how long would this take? To build. And the problem is that the developer would usually just be in the middle of some project and I would take them out of this. And as a developer, um, 
what I need, especially me, admittedly I'm not the best developer, but what any developer needs is a state of flow. Is a state of, okay, actually I've built up a mental model of whatever feature I have to build right now and how that plugs into my holistic architecture. And I have to now build this feature step by step. And whenever someone comes to me and says, hey, Philip, do you have a minute? My mental model is gone. And okay, personally, I need 10, 15 minutes each time to build this up. Probably more experienced people do get this done a bit quicker. But then again, they also build more complex and more complicated features. So same problem again. And whenever someone not technical comes to them or technical comes to them and interrupts them, the state of flow is just gone. And we, I mean, we all know the state of flow. You know, where you just get shit done. Where you have your headphones on, you have some background music, but not really focusing on this. And you just, you send 50 emails in an hour. Or you, for me, I by now, it's taken me a long time to learn this. Um, I, I can get into this while doing freaking accounting. You know, just getting all the bills out, wiring all the money, putting them into our accounting software. You get into this flow where you're just so much more productive and significantly happier. Um, and I think this is this is important for, for any non-technical person to understand. Don't fucking interrupt your developer. <laughs> whatever you have, whatever idea you have, whatever request you have, no one's going to die if you talk about this in two hours. And usually in two hours, you will also have thought about this a little more than, hey, it just popped into my head and I need to double check this immediately. So actually your conversations will be better and your developers will be so much more happy. Right. Man, you, you <laughs> unpacked so many memories for me, Philip. I, I mean, first of all, I want to say sorry to all of the developers that have ever worked here. for me. Uh, I'm pretty sorry. <laughs> Dooney, Andrew, Jeff, <laughs> Marcus, Teddy, Alex, Blanco, Vashko. I am so sorry for what I didn't know, you know? And that's. But I think it's a big challenge that we face, right? Because when you're a founder, you're an entrepreneur, you know, you're adapting to what you're learning, right? And everyone teaches you, especially with the more modern approaches, the lean startup is like, get something out to the market quickly, get feedback from the market, and go through the cycle of test, iterate, pivot, test, iterate, pivot. Yeah. So you're constantly moving, right? And you're, you know that your original idea is nascent, and in six months, three months, it might look totally different, right? If you, Absolutely. If, you ask a developer to go on that journey with you where you're constantly shifting priorities. Mm. That is oftentimes a recipe for disaster. Now, there are some tools, um, some processes. Maybe you can share what you think some of the best practices and approaches mm. are of, of dealing with that issue. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, and this is, this is one of my mantras, like, you don't have to be a developer, but you need to be able to talk to developers. And the way you talk to developers is, I mean, let's be honest, they have their very own language. And usually what happens is one of the business or non let's just say non-technical people, let's not uh, pile too much on, on business people. One of the non-technical people comes up and says, I have this idea, um, let's build the following feature. And for me, again, as a technical person, I then start thinking, okay, actually, what does this person want from me? So, same story. If I, as a founder, go up to a techie and say, I want to build a Tinder for dogs. That means, for me, as a techie, there is at least five different ways I can, what this person actually wants to build. One option would be for my little Fifi to find his or her perfect mate. Another option would be for dog owners to find their perfect mate. Completely different products, completely different database, completely different UI and UX potentially. And if I, as a non-technical founder, can't properly communicate with developers, what is it exactly that I have in my head, I have a problem. Because then I'm paying the developer a lot of money to figure out what I actually want from them. And on the way, it's super stressful for me and frustrating because I say, I want, I just want a fucking Tinder for dogs. And the developer will be like, oh, God, how does he not get this? Um, so I, 
I, I strongly believe in a, in a very simple process from my perspective. The first one is I need to very clearly get a product pitch done. And a product pitch is, for me, different than a financial pitch. Product pitch is target pain solution. Who is my target group? What is their pain? And I'm talking pain, not problem. I have 99 problems, to quote a very, very popular song a few years ago. <laughs> um, but I'm only willing to pay for pains to go away. And then what's the solution? And the more, especially initially, the more specific you are in this, the better. If you're building an e-commerce company, and you say, my target market is Germany, I'm going to call bullshit. Because whatever it is you're selling, and I really don't care, my grandparents are not going to buy online. It's not going to happen. No way. So Germany is not your target market, because my grandparents, and usually all people above 80, very unlikely that they really are your target market. And everyone below 10, probably neither, because they're neither capable nor allowed to buy shit online. So Germany is not your target market. Be as specific as possible. Mm -hmm. Students in small university towns, this is when we start talking, not students in Germany, mm -hmm. because we have, I think, 5 million students spread all over. And do you also take uh, the foreign students, or is it pro No, take very, very specific, okay, who is my initial target group? And then once you've figured out your product pitch, the second one is write your user stories. And user stories are extremely simple. As an X, I can do Y. So as a visitor, I can sign up. As a user, so as someone as, who has signed up, I can search for flats. As a user, I can look at a flat. As a user, I can book a flat. As an owner, I can add a flat. And as an owner, I can accept or refuse a booking. Those are user stories. And you know exactly I'm talking about Airbnb without ever having mentioned the name. Yeah. Um, and of course, Airbnb by now has a shit ton of other user stories. As a user, I can write a message to the host. As a user, I can pay. As a user, I can look at other experiences in the city. As a user, I can uh, request a refund. I can do a million things. But those few stories in the beginning, those are the core user stories of what Airbnb is about. And when I have an idea, I first write down the product pitch, then I write the user stories, but don't limit yourself to the core. First, get creative. Write as many user stories as you can. Because this is potentially, if this is your, going to be a startup, you're going to spend the next eight to 10 years, statistically, until you get towards an exit or towards you being able to really take your hands off, eight to 10 years. If it only has six user stories, do you really want to spend the next 10 years on this? Um, so get creative with this. Be aware, this is probably half of this you're going to throw out along, along the way, but just get creative, get thinking, okay, could I maybe do like the key delivery via drone or stuff like that? And once I've written the user stories, the third step is then to go very quickly um, from wireframe to mock-up to prototype. So actually start designing this. And this is, again, this is a basis for discussion. No one has to become a developer, but everyone should be able to talk to developers. And if my UI or UX designer has to actually get all this information out of me, again, I'm paying a lot of money. I'm making the process more stressful than it has to be. But if I sit down and use a tool, man, if it makes you happy, use fucking PowerPoint. I would recommend something like Figma or Sketch mm -hmm. um, or Adobe InDesign, whatever makes you happy. Use a tool. Or you can use one of these. Use I a freaking have, pen and paper. I still have mock-ups of my first mobile app that I drew by hand. Wonderful. Um, build or draw a mock-up. Mm -hmm. And if it's, a, if it's a digital prototype especially, you can, or clickable prototype, you can then go out, show this to a few customers, show this to your team and say, okay, this is the idea I have. And then you see, okay, how do they use it? And then an expert, an expert UI UX designer will say, Philip, this is nice, but we're going to change the following 50 things. Right. And that's absolutely fine. But we have a basis for discussion. And the same with the database design. Um, at the end of the day, database is not much more than Excel with different tabs. Um, if you take the time, you can learn the fundamentals of this in a weekend. And just to think about, okay, from my perspective, what is the data that I should be collecting in the individual steps of this users? What is the information I want to work with from a business perspective later on, or that I could potentially use? And for this, for me, the more data you can get, the better, because it makes you, especially in the early stages, this makes you able to actually run tests. And again, you don't have to draw the perfect database scheme with all the right connections. 
but have a basic. Let's say, okay, on the user, do I just need first name, last name, email, and password? Or do I need the age? Do I need the location for Airbnb? Potentially, location is important. Do I need the credit card information? What information is it I need? Um, and when I do this, target, so product pitch, user stories, then the mockups, and then the database design, I'm already better than 95% of the non-technical people walking around there, and I swear to God, developers are going to love you. They're going to love you. <laughs> They're not going to be like us a few years ago, right? So, you know, what you just kind of explained there essentially gets this, gets the founder to maybe an early product, an MVP yeah. or something. Along the way, as you and I both know, as our developers are building this initial product, we're getting new information. Yeah. Right. We're because while they're building, we're out selling and hustling and trying to find mm -hmm. customers mm -hmm. and trying to find clients and whatever it might be. Now we collect new information. Now this was the pain point that I always found is the market would tell me, you know, I had a B two B product and our client Fortune five hundred company would say we need this feature or we're not going to sign the deal. So now I'm running back to my developers who are knee deep in the process that we initially outlined, going stop. Big sharp turn, doing something different. What about processes and methods to be able to address these unforeseen circumstances and the new information that arises? I think the, the, the important part for this is to be upfront with the developers. Okay, why is this happening? Explain the why. A developer doesn't want to be a code monkey the same way um, any, any entrepreneur doesn't want to just spend their time doing accounting. They want to have a bigger purpose behind it and um, explaining the why of the initially and then why this new feature supersedes what I had originally planned is, from my perspective, really important. And again, if I go through this aforementioned process, I make the whole feature development so much easier than for any developer um, that it just goes much faster. I'm, I'm reducing the, the conversational friction that I otherwise very, very often have. So that for me is really important. And then just yeah, having, having a team that is in, I think it always helps to have a bigger mission, bigger mission, bigger vision. Because then you can always refer back to that and say, okay, this is why we're going to do this now. Well, one of the things I've always talked about is you know, finding developers that have that entrepreneurial mindset. Yep. It's obviously a huge value. When, you have, when your developers are able to think like a customer and they're not just thinking about the code, you know, now you have partners in your journey. I, I, I think any, so a few things. For me, number one, any developer um, should take at least a fundamental UX UI course understanding user research, understanding um, how, how to really think from a user perspective, understanding their emotional journey, understanding all these fundamentals of UI UX. And actually, from, from, from my perspective, any developer has to have this, I mean, yes, they have to have this technical knowledge, but they have to be, if they want to work in a startup, they should have this openness, they should have that entrepreneurial drive. You know, when, when I first built my first tech company, with my, my technical skills were pretty much ended at Excel. You know, yeah. it's a basic <laughs> Photoshop and, and things like that. And my next, my next startup, my goal was to bridge the gap because, frankly, I pissed off all of my developers. I'm sure none of them would ever want to work with me again. Like I said, <laughs> I've changed, boys. I've changed. I promise. But uh, what did you change? What I changed the most is... I didn't commit to be a developer. Mm -hmm. um, one, I committed to being able to speak the language of developers. And so as a guy that has a background in process and strategy and decision making, what I did is I decided I was going to learn to be a product manager mm -hmm. or a product owner mm -hmm. if we're talking in the agile context or whatever. And I figured if I could maybe not take the full leap into coding, but I could take one leap closer to it and yeah. be the middleman, then I can almost be the middleman between myself and the developers, which brings me one step closer. What that did for me was it taught me, it, well, A, it put me hands-on in managing software development projects and really understanding why things were taking slower, why things 
I thought would go really fast would go really slow. Why, in the, some cases, the changing the color of a button is not as easy as it sounds, yep. you know? And but to me, the biggest value was I learned the process. And I learned about Agile. I learned the differences between Agile and traditional waterfall processes. Mm -hmm. I ran mm -hmm. Scrum. Mm -hmm. um, so I really learned the process. And to me, the missing link was Agile. Because Agile gave me the opportunity where it served the entrepreneur in that since it's yeah. broken down in sprints and stories, and so it's not one long process that if you, you interrupt it, the whole process falls apart. Yeah. You know, it kind of served the entrepreneur and their hectic change of mind and whatnot, mm -hmm. and it served the developers that they could at least get through, go from A to B, you know, and if something changed, at least they got to complete the chore that they had to yeah, do with that. Yeah, yeah. So that was my experience. Do you have some insights on on the processes and really what's gonna what's gonna take the non technical entrepreneurs that are listening here what they need to know to be really well suited to work with developers? Um, I think one 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 hack hack we're using which works extremely well is don't have a QA department. Don't have a QA department. It means every developer is responsible for their feature from A to Z. Right. That's quality assurance, by um, the way. Just yeah, qu that sorry, that. quality assurance. Um, it gives developers a much stronger sense of ownership. And that, that will help you um, to, to, to yeah, just have them more with an entrepreneurial mindset. Generally, um, I'm a big fan of Agile in theory. Um, I think... Uh, at the end of the day, you need to have a somewhat pragmatic approach to it. Um, there are people who do it very dogmatically, and that tends to not work out as well. But a pragmatic approach to it where you have stand-ups, where you have um, reviews, where you just say, okay, um, we're committing to the following feature development cycle for the next two weeks, and then we have another review, and we see, okay, what are the priorities now? And even if your Fortune 100 client comes and says, okay, I need this feature, otherwise I'm not signing the deal, I can promise you they will sign the deal also four weeks down the line if this only goes into the next sprint, if it really is that important. And um, from, from my perspective, I think uh, that really helps. Um, then generally, Lean Startup um, is a book every founder, from my perspective, has to have read. Um, just to understand this process of, okay, how do I quickly iterate my way to success? Um, instead of uh, building a product for 6, 12, 18 months, and then launching to figure out nobody cares, um, that is usually rather costly and uh, not a great feeling. So um, read that book, um, look into Agile, but don't follow it too dogmatically. Um, and then you're already quite quite well along the way. So let's talk a little bit about just a few of the. You mentioned some of the tools that you teach the developers. Yeah. Then I go on. Um, speaking to the founders now, you know, like I I was exposed to GitHub. I had never been exposed to that before. We we use Rally for an agile tool. Um, there were a number of different technologies and tools mm. as a non-technical person that I had to be introduced to at least on a basic level. What would what kind of advice would you give those non-technical founders on some homework they can do to prepare themselves if they're going to get into tech entrepreneurship? I think understanding what Git and GitHub does is really helpful and at the end of the day it's very simple. It's a Dropbox for code um, where developers can put code online and they can collaborate on it. Um, then understanding, okay, what are tools to, to do properly, do um, Agile, for example. Um, and you can use, for example, Trello for a very, very basic version of it. Um, then understanding, okay, all, all, the, all the environment the developer needs, okay. So, as we said, very, very quiet um, area, to be able to get into the flow, uh, no distractions. I think other tools, um, it always depends on the language, on the framework you're using there. Um, so that is rather open and up to the developers. 
just make sure you find a developer that is pragmatic in the develop or find developers that are pragmatic in their development approach and say, okay, this is how we can quickly do this and not how to always do the perfect solution to this. Well, you have brought up the topic, <laughs> a topic that is dear to my heart twice now, which is the topic of flow. Mm -hmm. And I think I mentioned to you earlier, that's what I'm doing my PhD research on. And uh, Flow is something that I've experienced in athletics mm -hmm. and uh, to a lesser degree, but to some degree in business as well. You know, I've certainly gotten into an Excel model and snapped out of it three hours later and said, yeah. holy shit, I just spent three hours geeking out on Excel, <laughs> which speaks a little bit of my OCD personality. But how do you how do you see the role of getting into this flow, this deep concentration, this kind of very intrinsic, and I think that's an important part to mention of it, is flow is not something you get into for a monetary reward or mm -hmm. for some extrinsic mm -hmm. motivation. And one of the things I learned with the developers is so many coders, so many developers, you know, they have an engineering mindset. They want to solve problems, mm. right? If you give them a problem to solve, you know, they can they take it on, they take the ownership of the problem, it becomes very intrinsically yeah. motivating, yeah. right? Tell me a little bit about this idea of achieving flow states as developers and you know what what's needed, what kind of triggers and what kind of conditions are required. I think they're different from what an entrepreneur needs. Yeah, I, I think for a developer, you need to be able to build up a mental model of what, what you're building, as we said. So I need a certain degree of quietness. Um, I think like these huge open office floor plans are super detrimental to this, actually. And I see it with our developers. They have their own office and they really really need this. So kill the co-working um, space is what you're saying? Kill the co-working space, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. However, there is actually a baseline of sound that is very, very helpful. And whether for you that is classical music or there is websites where you can basically tune into um, background chatter of a cafe uh, at, a, at a certain decibel level that gets you extremely, or supposedly gets you extremely productive. So corporate quietness is not the optimal state. Um, then you, you need to be able to focus. You need really no, no distractions on your desk, no distractions like uh, phone notifications, emails popping up on, on your laptop screen, all these things. Every time there's a little pop-up, you lose your focus. Maybe not 100%, but if this happens regularly, I, I know, for example, our developers, and by now, me personally as well, turn off all notifications. Turn off literally email notifications, they turn off all Slack notifications, WhatsApp, you name it, they just tune it out. And it's a nice feeling because every time there is this little ping, it gives you a tiny amount of stress. Just a teeny tiny, it's not like, oh God, I'm going to die, but it gives you a tiny amount of stress. Oh God, there is, there is a, I basically, there is an urge to check out, okay, what is this message about? And to create a state where I don't even can, can get this urge by not having all these pop-up, all these push notifications, um, is from my perspective one of the most valuable things I did in the last year. It, it's um, a really good point. I, I really, for me, I've turned on my phone and on my laptop for any time. I really, I turn off all notifications. The only notifications I get is when someone calls me. Or if I get a text message um, and my girlfriend is the only one knowing this, so she's the only one sending me text messages instead of WhatsApp. <laughs> it, it, it's such a good point that you make, and I think it's something that's relevant not just to, to software developers, but it's relevant Absolutely to, not. to everyone in this world. It, it, it's relevant to you and me. A hundred percent agree. The more this, and let's be honest here, the state of flow is amazing because you just get so much done, and it's so much more fun to work on stuff and just you know, crunch through it, then sit there and be like, oh shit, can I go on Facebook already? Or no, I should do another five minutes of this. Um. It's, <laughs> it's so unfortunate too, because as entrepreneurs, we're taught at early on that a successful entrepreneur is the one that's laser focused, that works harder than everybody else, that puts mm -hmm. in all the long mm -hmm. hours and is 100% committed to what they're trying to do. And, you know, there's, to a certain extent, there's some truth to that as well. But it's not, 
it's not how hard or how long you work, it's how well you work. Right? Yeah. And I think quality over quantity, and that was something that took me till my fifth business to figure out that you know sometimes I'd say I gotta be the first one in and the last one out, and I would literally be at my desk for 14 hours, yeah. five of which had any value whatsoever. Yeah. The rest of it was my mind drifting, or like you said, searching the Facebook, or, or doing these different things. And, the, the notifications is such a really good point. And, you know, there's actually, you can measure the hormones in the human body. When you get a Facebook notification, you get a dopamine fix. Yeah. Right? It, it's the same as doing cocaine. Your body is shooting a hormone that says, oh, I feel good. I'm being accepted. People like me. Yeah. Or if I get a work email, cortisol fix, stress, right? Cortisol fires. That is the stress hormone. So, Literally, the technologies that we have, these distractions, are firing these crazy hormones and making our brain go haywire. So it makes it very, very difficult to perform at our best. And there, there is this expectation sometimes you have, A, you have to work 14, 16 hours a day as a founder. I think, yes, you have to work really hard, but I'd rather work 12 hours and most of the time super concentrated. And then I go home and I have a beer with friends and I'm happy. I'm doing these 16 hours, again, as you said, five of them are productive. The rest you can just throw out of the window. Um, at the same time, there is this expectation you need to answer to any email in two minutes. Super strong, especially among founders who come from a consulting background. Because in consulting, if you've been to McKay or BCG, you know, you got to be super responsive. And for me, that means people don't work. They don't work, pro as you said, you know, you are not properly working. Um, so I actually, uh, if I may plug in a little bit of advertisement here, just for one startup, adios.ai, it's completely free and what it does is it batches your emails. I get my emails three times a day, at 7 a.m., at 1 p.m., and at 5 p.m. Otherwise, I don't get emails. Yeah. And it's just, a, it's a good feeling because I know I don't have, there's no point in me looking into my email inbox because there won't be anything until 1 p.m. Uh, so I, I had to, basically, I had to train myself, and I, and I had to use a tool, and that one is from a friend of mine. Um, yeah. It's a great tool. It's a great tool. Um, oh, however, the fucking, whatever tool you use, but having your emails batched, again, do you think you're that important for all these notifications, for all these emails, do you really think you're that important that people are going to die or people are going to suffer long-lasting financial pains or financial uh, losses? Just because you didn't respond in the last in the, in, within four hours. That's right. Yeah. That that's always the the an old mentor of mine always relativized stuff like okay, Philip on a drama scale from one to ten, ten is someone's dying, nine is someone really will suffer financially and suffer a lot. Um, eight is okay, someone is significantly hurt over a long longer period. Seven is someone will have a high financial loss. And so far, I, I haven't had a single situation where any of these, so any catastrophe I had was maximum a six on the scale. And it puts stuff into a very nice perspective. Right. That's, good, that's <laughs> so true. You know, I, I actually started doing that, you know, based on what Tim Ferriss does. Don't check your email first thing in the morning. Have your morning routine. Mm -hmm. Check it once in the morning. And what he does is he actually puts an autoresponder saying, if you've emailed me after 8 a.m., I will not be checking email again until 3 p.m. And he's got that set up to go every day. So he checks it twice a day, and, and that's it. And I, I don't have that autoresponder still. I, I don't even need that no, anymore. No one, yeah. no, one's had, no one has complained so far. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's a really great way you know, to, to start life hacking a little bit. And yeah. I think it's, um, you know, one of the, the things I'd like to mention about that, that I learned as I started to work with software developers more is, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a, a business guy or you're a founder and you do have this ethos of, I'm going to be working 12, 14 hours a day. This is one of the mistakes that I made is I had the expectation or at least the ideal that my employees would be working as much as me. Mm -hmm. What I, and some of them did. But what I didn't realize at the time is a coder cannot code for 14 hours. Exactly. You know? And <laughs> over time with the software company that I, we started 
to track billable versus non-billable hours and really start to look at what productivity was like. Mm -hmm. And be super well-balanced, healthy, fit, deep concentration type of coders, if they could pull five to six hours out in a day, that's highly productive. What we what I saw is like four solid hours was a reasonable expectation yeah. to have. And I think that's a big difference, right, than what the entrepreneur is taught to believe, especially the management consulting guys that are working 16, 18 hours mm -hmm. a day. And then you have a coder that really is getting four or five productive hours out. There's exactly. a tension. <laughs> there's a tension. Like, yeah. there's a, is, do you explore those soft skills at all when you're teaching people how to get into this world? Um, or are they just kind of figuring it out on the fly? And maybe do you have any lessons for, for either side of that situation? Mm. Well, here, I've I, I got to be honest. Um, I mean, our coding bootcamp is 10 hours a day. We make this intentionally super intense, incredibly hard, incredibly frustrating. Uh, this is, but this is something where we know, okay, over time, um, when you're not learning, but you really have to build again, yeah, four, five, six hours, really productive. That's absolute best case. Um, so admittedly, we don't teach that as much as we probably should. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> that's a, a big it's, lesson it's a good point. for the entrepreneur, yeah. Yeah. for sure, you know. Um, Absolutely. So where is the Verdon in Berlin now? What is the what is the kind of current situation, and what's what does your future look like in this organization? Um, we're at we're in thirty cities by now. We have around about four thousand alumni, and are growing quite well globally. We're looking at a few additional cities to open in twenty nineteen. Um, we're going into university education actually. Um, we just closed, or are, well, by the time we're done here, we've closed a deal um, with WHU uh, to offer tech courses to all students. Um, we're also doing corporate education more and more, bringing corporates into the 21st century, explaining okay, digital literacy, these are the main terms you need to know. If you go to friends of mine work in, in traditional industries and uh, there, the knowledge is just non-existent. You can be a engine engineer at Volkswagen, and then your next career step is being a project manager for a digital product. Without any previous training, without any knowledge of how do digital products work, how do they monetize, what are the KPIs there, all of these things. Um, I know of a case where actually a manufacturer wanted to implement one of the KPIs was the failure rate per thousand users. Which makes sense if you build some if you build a physical product, the failure rate per thousand products, fine. Not so much in a digital product does not make sense. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and doing a lot of education there. Yeah, that's uh those are some famous manufacturing stories about <laughs> that actually. I, I know you're pressed for time and yeah. you probably have to go to Berlin, back to Berlin and you have other meetings, but I want to just do a quick mm. couple rapid fire things from you. Sure. Um, the first one is is I'm always interested in what successful entrepreneurs and innovators, um, especially ones that come back to places like their alma mater, you know, with this ethos of giving first and giving back. Um, what advice do you have? for aspiring entrepreneurs that are interested in getting into the technology, technology entrepreneurship, or going down a similar path as you? Um, two things. Number one, maximize your exposure to getting lucky. Um, just showing up is 80% of, of, of the deal. And there's been so many meetings where I expected nothing, and I was like, do I really, really want to do this? No. But nevertheless, I went there and maybe not at that time, but two years later, something amazing came out of it. Finding our office was, I, I, I was crazy time strapped and um, I had to find an office and I went to over 50 different ones and none of them were good. And then I found this ad without even pictures and I, I called the owner and I was like, yeah, can I come by? And he was like, yeah, sure. And then I had two other viewings and I was just, I was done with it. I thought, okay, I'm going to go for something here that I have and that's it. And then driving home, I, I, I really, I was rather close to burnout at that point. I said, ah, oh, fuck it, I'll, I'll, it's just a 10 minute detour, I'm, I'm gonna do it. 
So I did the detour, saw the, I literally have walked through the door and said, we're going to take it. it maximize your exposure to get lucky. Um, give first, um, absolutely agreeing with that. Uh, help people first. Don't expect anything from anyone if you help them, but help them if you can. Um, and yes, there will be assholes taking advantage of you, but so fucking be it. I still rather be looking back and saying, hey, I helped a lot of people. Um, and looking back and saying, no, I didn't, like, there was the potential that he would never pay me back. Yeah, so what? Um, and the, the third one, for, for especially for founders, um, I heard this myself, didn't believe it, didn't do it, paid dearly for it, uh, is uh, your first hire as a founder should be a controller, which is, for, for me at the time, sounded really weird. Why the fuck would I hire controlling, really, the finance guys as an entrepreneur? No. Um, but if you don't have your numbers clean, if you don't have your accounting clean, let me tell you, you're going to pay for this. You're going to pay for it so dearly. That's true. Especially if you're going to raise capital. Especially Nobody you... wants to cut you a check if your books are a mess because they know you're not going to do a good job of spending their money. If your books are a mess, if you, can't, if you don't measure your KPIs um, in the product either or don't properly measure them, that's just a huge red flag. And uh, yeah, don't, don't be as stupid as I. <laughs> you and me both, brother. We've both been down that road. <laughs> you know, the great thing about making mistakes, if you're if you're good at this, is you only make them once. Exactly. And you never <laughs> forget those mistakes. That, that is a lecture I keep passing on. And I'm sure only half of you will listen to it, but the other half, uh, you're in for a ride. And not a fun one. <laughs> All right. Two quick rapid fire questions. I ask everyone these. Sure. Number one, what book is on your bedside table? Um, right now, Radical Candor. Started it actually on the flight here um, to see, okay, uh, how can I improve my communication with people? Great, great book. You know? I have very high hopes. It's been very, very highly recommended to me. And learning how to say no. You know? Okay. So, so, <laughs> so many people say, oh, sure, I think I can do that, and, you know, and just kind of fade into oblivion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having that candor. Ah, great. <laughs> great message, great book. I highly recommend it too. Other, other than that, a uh, book from 2018, um, very tough one, but The Tattooist of Auschwitz. Oh. Super fucking, like, very, very intimate story of the guy who did the tattoos in Auschwitz. But Oof. heavy. Ha heavy, but highly, highly, highly recommended. Cool, cool. I'll have to check that one out. I'm not familiar with it. And the last question um, What do you. What's on your playlist right now? Um, very, very, very changing. Right now, um, The Dead South, In Hell I'll Be In Good Company, is something that just, I don't know, I put that song on and I get instantly happy. And an all-time favorite of mine is uh, Pachel, Pachelbel's Canon in D. Mm. Um, is that your flow state? Music? That is my flow yeah, state. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Honestly, I, I discovered it writing my bachelor thesis, actually, back in the day. So seven years ago, and um, I, I had that song on loop. I actually back then it was not Spotify, but I still used iTunes. And in retrospect, I think I have played it 972 times. Um, so I, I can sing along to that. Anyways, um, so I highly recommend flow state music. Awesome, awesome. That's Philip on our side. It was yes. great to have you here. I could talk with you for hours <laughs> more. Um, I hope we get a chance to do it again. And I do so as well. Man, Thank you so much. Best of luck with your journey. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks mate. Cheers, mate.